Thank you. All right, welcome everybody. Today we're going to talk about library programs for children with disabilities, uh, what libraries are doing well and how they can improve. And this uh, information, this is going to come some, from some preliminary data that I've gathered from an IMLS grant that I'm working on. And that grant is called Services for Children of All Abilities in Libraries and Explo Exploration or Scale. So um, if you don't like that name, I didn't personally come up with it. I was told that we would have a better chance of getting accepted if we had a fun acronym. So if that seems a little complicated, uh, that's the story behind that. So, all right, I'm pressing to turn the slides and nothing's happening. I wonder why that's happening. We're not off to a very good start, are we? My screen is locked up, I guess. There we go. I, I hope I don't have to do that every time. Oh, there we go. I don't know what it was. Okay. So this is the research team for the project that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, the leader of the research is that middle top person there. That's Maria Cahill. She's a library professor at the University of Kentucky. And with her is uh, Carolyn Gooden, who is a special education uh, professor. And then they have a research assistant there, Derek. Then Missouri is also a part of this grant, and that's led up by Denise Atkins, and she is a library professor. And then Melissa Stormont is a special education professor. And then I am leading up the Kansas uh, arm of this research and with Carol Russell, who is our special education professor here at Emporia State University. So this is the research team. I'm presenting on this today, but I didn't do all of this myself. So this is the team of people. And at the end, I will have contact information for all of them. If you have any further questions, um, you can feel free to ask any individuals as well. So this project, uh, as I said, it's called Services for Children of All Abilities in Libraries and Explor Exploration Explorations or Scale. And it is a three state project. Uh, that is IMLS funded. It was almost a half a million dollars in funding. And uh, it is to support libraries in serving young children with disabilities and developmental dis delays. And we're looking at multiple case studies. And I'm going to talk more about that. And again, this what, that I'm going to talk to you about today is just from the first bit of data that we've gathered. So if this is something that interests you, stay tuned. This is just the very tip of the iceberg. So how did I get involved in this research? Um, I know when I was a student, I was always like, how do you get involved with all these grants and things like this? How does this come up? So I had written an article when I was a PhD student with Denise Atkins, who you saw on the previous screen from University of Missouri. That's where I went to school. And it was called a special needs approach. And it was about how libraries can start programs for children with disabilities. And uh, when Maria Cahill wanted to start this and apply for this IMLS grant, she pulled a review of literature. And as part of that, she pulled this study that Denise and I had done back in 2015. And so she thought, well, I'll just invite these people on my project because I don't know who else to ask about this. So um, we said yes. This initial study that I conducted with Denise Atkins, we did it, as I said, in 2015, and it was just a survey initially of 185 librarians. And um, we had about 39 respondents, and they all stated, just a brief summary of what we found, that autism was the most prevalent disability that libraries were experiencing, and that um, the most common accommodation was, uh-oh, was uh, the request for hearing impairment accommodations. So um, th that was the two main findings. We also did some follow-up interviews to collect some qualitative data uh, about impetus for programming, marketing, what kinds of equipment that they used and challenges. So that's just a little bit of the project inspiration, but then this project, this IMLS grant is much, much larger. We're looking at much more in-depth things. So the purpose of scale, the purpose of this IMLS grant that I'm talking to you about now is to determine what libraries are doing well 
to serve young children with disabilities and developmental delays. And a lot of that consists of, so like in the past when I've conducted this kind of research and I asked librarians, librarians are like notoriously not self-promoting, right? So they don't always say what they're doing that works really well. So the idea with this research is not only that would we interview people, but we would also observe some story times, observe some outreach programming, and we would talk then with the librarians and what we call like a play-by-play. -play. So we record the librarians and then we kind of say like, hey, children's librarian, I noticed right here, you kind of touched Timmy's arm. Can you kind of tell me why you did that? You know, and then the librarian might say, well, I know when we sing songs about frogs that Timmy likes to really get wild, right? So it's kind of learning more about these things that librarians really do well, that they aren't even really aware that they do well. These kind of subtle cues that they're reading, these kind of uh, behavior modifications they do uh, that work really well. And the idea is that eventually we're going to be able to produce some instructional tools as a result of this. So the whole idea, of course, is to assist libraries in developing and tailoring services to better serve young children with disabilities and developmental delays and their family. I don't know why my pages won't turn all the time. Okay, so the methods that we're gonna talk about today, as I said, this is just the very preliminary data. So I don't have for you all the recordings. I've started to do some of those, but I don't have all of the data compiled from those. So I'm gonna to talk to you about the very first thing we did, which is interviewing 13 early intervention service coordinators. Now these people are also sometimes called part C coordinators, if you're familiar with that term, but generally they work with children ages zero to five who have some sort of a disability. They might be writing those IEP plans um, and they have some interface with the library. And I'll talk more about that. So who we interviewed, we interviewed two of those folks in Kansas, three in Kentucky and one in Missouri. And we did that using Zoom. Uh, and this was March 22 through April 22 is when these uh, interviews took place. And that today is what I'm going to talk to you about is some of the findings from this data from these Part C coordinators, these people who work with young children with disabilities. What can the library be doing to support this work? So that we're going to talk about today what libraries are doing really well, uh, partnerships and collaborations, and then what can we do be doing even better. So first, of course, let's talk about uh, on a positive note, what are libraries doing well? Well, I know I don't need to tell all of you, we've just gone through this pandemic. So, you know, we've quickly had to change modes and things are very different for libraries than they once were. So I'll be talking about kind of pre-pandemic and, and uh, during the pandemic things, but libraries provide access. They do a good job of providing access to community information. In a lot of communities, they were providing diagnostic screenings. So, you know, helping people figure out, does, does my kiddo need this or that service? Free literacy materials and services. So that seems obvious, right? That's what we do really well. Another thing that people, that these coordinators said we do really well is provide a site for social opportunities for adults and children. So, and this is a quote from the research, specifically for a lot of families that we work with, with delays and disabilities, the library was a place where they could potentially go and interact with the community and feel safe to take their children there. So that's a very positive thing. During the pandemic, libraries did a really great job, according to these folks, of providing take-home materials, um, virtual story times and recorded story times. We heard a lot about how accessible these were, right? People didn't have to worry about if their kid liked to clap a lot or flap their arms that they were going to disrupt other people if it's a virtual story time. So that was good to hear that those are perceived to be quite accessible. Um, and then libraries did a good job of being physically accessible or ADA compliant, which I don't think we can give ourselves too big of accolades for since that's just being legally compliant with what we need to do, right? 
But there were some uh, comments about Carnegie libraries, which anyone who's worked in one, we know that they are sometimes the exception that these older libraries, there's, you know, if the elevator breaks, it's hard to get around the library or if someone parks on the ramp, you, you know, you can't get up there. So they had some specific challenges, but these are overall what, what they felt like we were doing well. Libraries also did a good job of being a hub of information. So it was somewhere for uh, families to go to get information about maybe a diagnosis that their child has. And um, libraries have a lot of information about community resources and lots of uh, different areas of access to be aware of. So for libraries that are making those things available, they were doing a really good job about that of maybe you know, if you have a kiddo with this going on, here's some different services in the community that you can receive. Or, you know, sometimes having a, a kiddo who has a disability puts you at a financial hardship and maybe you need some different kinds of services, but making those available is really important and something that libraries were commended on doing well. Um, a certain library gave the ages and stages questionnaire. Now that is from Kentucky. I'm not familiar with that, but I believe it's an assessment tool. And they have it also, this library had this available online. So if parents had questions, you know, they could do the, the test there in the library with the children. And then libraries also were a good information hub, hub just by having resources, by having books and play items and things like that available for the kiddos and the families. Libraries are doing a great job with socialization. So a lot of the participants reported that libraries are a place they can potentially go and interact in the community and feel safe to take their child there, uh, where they would be able to go no matter what their child's uh, diagnosis was, and where they would have support. So a lot of times these coordinators that we were interviewing, they're writing these IEP plans, they're writing these plans for kiddos, and they wanna have an element of the plan that sort of places them in the community. So they really talked about how libraries are a good way to do this. We can encourage families to go out in the community somewhere that's free, they can get resources, get some socialization, that's all positive. Um, also, uh, some respondents said many of our children in our program, they don't go to daycare or have other social situations where they're able to interact with other families. So it's really important for the family and child to be able to have those experiences to form a bond with other children and those families. And from other research I've, I've done, particularly with deaf and hard of hearing kiddos, uh, sometimes when your child gets a diagnosis, it can be quite isolating, right? So just having the place of the library where you can go and you can connect with other people who have kiddos your own age. And a lot of times that intervention isn't really happening on too serious of a level until the kiddo gets in kindergarten. So again, this library can often fill in that socialization gap for some kids. And then one library, uh, one respondent reported, we now have a core group of moms who have kiddos within our program who have developed friendships and meet outside the library. And I know when I was a children's library, that was the case too. A lot of mommy and me groups would form at the library and people would have these lifelong friendships with people who they brought to story time with their kids, which is really cute, I think. All right, I did. Uh, beyond the walls of the library, during times of social distancing and beyond. So this is, again, some of the things that libraries were doing really well during the pandemic. So lots of different kits and things to put together uh, that families can take home and do together. Libraries did a lot of Zoom things, a lot of Facebook activities like bear hunts and sidewalk chalk, where they could draw things on the sidewalk of the driveway at home and then drive around and identify those things. So lots of creative ideas of like, how can we make people feel connected even when they can't get together? in a physical way. The library continued to offer play and learn groups, but virtually, and they had Wi-Fi adapters that people could check out because that's another accessibility issue. I mean, can you imagine you all not having Wi-Fi during the pandemic? That would, I mean, how isolating would that be? 
The library would also go to the low income apartments, someone from Missouri reported, so that they could access those programs because if they don't have transportation, they're not able to get those books uh, into their hands. So transportation was a big thing that people talked about in this study. For people who don't have a car, transportation is already an issue. When you have a lot of little kids, transportation is a big issue. And then if one of those kids has any kind of mobility issues, you really have a hard time getting from place to place. All right, the library did a great job of being a, a place for everyone. So it's accessible to all children, birth, uh, ages birth to five, whether they're neurodiverse or typically developing. If they're not typically developing, if they're infants, toddlers, or whatever, uh, it was welcoming. Some of our families, if we can't meet them in their home, sometimes the library is a good uh, location that they can meet. So this is somebody who's talking about first steps. Different states call these programs different kinds of things. Like I'm from Missouri, there's parents as teachers. But the idea is with these, they're early intervention specialists and they go into often the home and they interact with the parents. They sometimes they give them free toys and free books. And the biggest thing that they do is they tell them developmentally what's going on with their kids. So your kiddo's developing normally in these ways, maybe they need to work a little bit on these things. And for some people, uh, I'm sure you can imagine the idea of having a government agency person come into your home can be uncomfortable for maybe all kinds of reasons. So um, the first steps providers were saying we can offer the library as an alternative, and that's a really good thing. It's that kind of third space that we talk about sometimes in libraries. The good thing about the library is it's always free, right? And again, when we're trying to work on kiddos with like getting out, socializing, um, sending them somewhere where they don't have to spend money just to exist, that's a big deal. So libraries are accessible because every county has one. They might vary in size and might do different things differently in each county, but they do have one. So that makes it really unique and a powerful resource um, that we've continued to sustain. So, and that, you know, Everywhere does have a library pretty much um, and not maybe everywhere has even a McDonald's or a, other places you can meet. So that's a good thing. All right, so now with partnerships, what are some of the partnerships that are, are, are working? So those of you who are children's librarians or maybe you wanna be children's librarians, you're probably pretty aware that partnerships are so important in serving people. They're really important in reaching out to our communities. They're really important in getting people into the door. So these were some of the partnerships that were identified as working for serving children with disabilities. So participating in community early childhood councils, this works very well. And the quote is, we have an early childhood council. I sit on it as one of the first step partners um, along with the library and a fiscal agent. So if you're a children's librarian and you wanna be a child's, ch children's librarian, this thinking about what are some of the kinds of things I can join to be seen as, um, as a willing partner. Uh, library is going to health information fairs and, and other kinds of fairs. Partnering with community service providers, so places like First Steps, the public school system, local daycares, uh, providing those free diagnostic screenings. So even if you as the librarian, you don't know how to provide that screening, you know, get your, your partner that you've made at First Steps or parents as teachers to come over and host a day of screening at the library. Facilitating preschool enrollment. So a lot of times people aren't exactly sure, especially if it's their first kiddo, like what do I need to do to get this kid in school? And especially if you're gonna go to preschool, um, for those of you who are parents, you know, preschool can be kind of hard to get your kids in. And so sometimes the, you really need to sign them up a lot earlier in life than what you would think. Like the waiting list can be like a year or two. And then resource sharing with other libraries, of course, work, working really well for, for libraries. Partnering with outside service agencies. The Dolly Parton Imagination Library was um, mentioned by several people as a great partnership and a way to get free books into the hands of kids. 
uh, and parents as teachers, which I mentioned. And the quote there is, we have several different advisory meetings through parents as teachers, through the hub work that's going on in our state, and we've made a lot of connections there. So those are some of the partnerships that are working well. Now let's talk a little bit about partnerships that might improve. So some of the ways that were mentioned about how we can improve partnerships is just to expand the partnerships that we already have within the community. Um, a lot of people talked about co improving communication for the purposes of improved collaboration. So the idea of like, I know there are all these other people out here who serve these same groups as me. Um, so how can I communicate with them what we're doing and find out what they're doing so that we're not competing when really we have the same audience, right? Establish protocols to improve collaboration with community resource providers. So again, more collaboration, more communication. Expand partnerships with outside service providers to enrich resources and service provision. And the quote here is, I know some of the libraries have book giveaways where ch a child can take a book home with them, but it would be great if they could partner to offer those books. So we can reach more people maybe if we work together. This is a big one that sometimes I think new librarians don't think of. Expand those partnerships to uh, uh, related to expertise and training. So if you say, if you hear from your, your librarians that you're working with, well, I don't really know how to serve these people. Well, let's get somebody to come in and train us on that, you know, or if, if it's like, well, this makes me uncomfortable. Well, let's get you comfortable with it. Let's let's figure it out. And the way that we do that is through those partnerships and just asking those folks, hey, could you come and talk to us um, and just give us a, you know, maybe just during our staff meeting, just talk to us briefly about autism support or whatever. So uh, the quote here is even hearing from the school for the deaf or the blind, just some trainings to learn basic things, just some basic knowledge. And the more we know about people, the better we are gonna be able to assist them. And aim to improve the service capacity of the public library, letting people know. So often I think people have this perception of us that we are sort of passive, right? As librarians, and not really that we wanna be proactive, that we wanna practice embedded librarianship figure out what they need before they even maybe ask for it and provide that for them. So some of the community involvement keys, we gotta get the word out. So the communication of what we're doing, getting that out to the public, but even more so getting it out to these particular families and the partnerships that also serve those families. Because sometimes I know in my life, uh, the first time I hear about something, I disregard it, maybe even the second time. But if it comes up again, then I'm like, oh, yeah, maybe I'll do that. So, you know, whenever we have partnerships and they're advertising for what we're doing, and we're advertising for what they're doing, then people, we get in people's ear a little bit better. Offer even more opportunities for social interaction. So even though uh, these, um, these coordinators did give us lots of uh, accolades and saying like, yes, you did a good job with social interaction, providing that even more because we do have a little bit of a stigma where it's like the library is not necessarily a social place, right? It's like the library is somewhere you have to be quiet, you're not supposed to eat, you're not supposed to, you know, people have a lot of ideas around the library that maybe aren't true. So just offering more opportunities for those social, social programs. Increasing outreach efforts, which of course is easier said than done. It requires you know, training and staffing and all of that kind of stuff, but that can be a good way to do outfacing community involvement work. Continue to redesign family-friendly spaces. So uh, a lot of these coordinators talked about making sure your library has places where families can get on the floor together, or if someone's in a wheelchair, they can get out of their wheelchair and kind of be on the floor. Um, there's kind of some spread out space. It makes for more interaction. And then uh, providing those uh, that additional training, which we've talked about how we can do that. So specifically, how can we get the word out? So this quote is, I've shared information. Oh, you know, we have preschool story time, but most of them never even heard of it and they don't know that it exists. And so there is, you know, 
story times, a lot of times we have them at one particular time of day, at one particular day of the week, when the reality is most people are at work then. And then also when we break those story times down to, you know, okay, well, we're going to have a two-year-old story time. Well, what am I supposed to do with my other kids while I take my two-year-old to story time? So I'm not necessarily saying that these are bad things. It's not that it's bad to offer a story time at two o'clock on Tuesday for two-year-olds, but you have to be cognizant of who you are excluding by doing this. And you have to be clear if it's okay to bring your other kids, those kinds of things. And if you're offering something just during the day, what are you offering for working parents? You know, what are you offering? And not that everyone works in the day, but you see what I mean. We want to make sure that we're not just like, sometimes programs are designed without the people involved who we're trying to serve. There's a disability slogan that says, nothing about us without us, right? So if we consulted people about what they want and then designed the program, people would come. But what I often hear librarians talk about is like, well, we're offering this and, and no one's coming. It's like, well, there's something off there, right? There's something that doesn't quite work for people. It's not they don't like you, not that they don't like the program maybe, but there's just something that you need to tweak. Um, so another way to get the word out, I don't really have a grasp of what they're doing right now. So maybe libraries could be more proactive in reaching out. And I'm sure that we hear this all the time. I know whenever you all have told people you wanna to go to library school, the first thing they say is like, do people still go to libraries, right? Like. People are just not aware of what we do. I don't know why we have this PR problem, um, but we've got to be more diligent about getting the word out about the good work that we are doing. So this person said, we're an agency that covers several different counties, in fact, eight or nine counties. So coordinated communication would be good. So from, her, from this person's perspective, that makes a lot of sense of like, not only what is my library doing, but what are all the libraries in the area doing so that we can share that information with parent organizations that then serve all of those counties. I can see how that would be really helpful for them. And then this one person from Kentucky, they said this one library, they do ASQs, which those are those screening tools. Um, and if there was some kind of way that they can advertise that so that parents would know, hey, you can get your kiddo screened at the library. Because I'm sure a lot of parents are not aware of that. So now talking more about things that libraries could do to improve. Increase communication about services within the community. We've already talked a lot about that. Um, increase access and literacy material provisions. Mostly that's through, gonna be through outreach, through bookmobiles, uh, because of people having issues coming into the library. They mentioned targeting underserved areas and expanding operating hours. So that was comments that we received as like, you know, I tried to go to the library after work and meet with this family, but they were closed. So, <clears throat> you know, we can only do so much, but just keeping in mind of are our operating hours the most optimal for our community? If we have a working community, um, maybe we should shift a little bit. Increase opportunities for social interaction. And we've talked a lot about that. The libraries are doing a good job with that, but that's something people really want. Um, I think, you know, people are, they, they want the, the library to fill a part of the community that when you go there, you have engaged in something social. Provide library spaces and programs uh, for young children with disabilities and their families. And the quote here is having different areas and making sure we have toys that represent all different abilities, creating special rooms, sensory rooms that everybody could check out. So as much as possible, having a space in your library for certain things, having something that you can do if someone is having, needing a sensory space um, or if they need a sensory toy, being aware of kind of all of the needs that children have. Increase training opportunities for library staff. Um, the education that we can do is to make a library more accessible for children with delays and disabilities. The more that we as librarians learn about the needs of these populations, 
the more we can see those sort of obstacles that we didn't see before, those barriers to service that we were not aware of because we didn't even know that maybe this was an issue for families experiencing this. So working parents, uh, accommodating working parents with some feedback we got that we could do better. So sometimes in the rural counties, ugh, getting to the library can be a problem because they don't stay open as late. And I kind of alluded to this before. When I was a working parent, I couldn't get to the library that um, because I worked and I don't even think they were open on Saturday. So, <clears throat> and then again, more socialization, more different support groups. So. We talked about, you know, not only having story times, not only having things like that, but but maybe having some sort of a, a support group for children with disabilities. Thinking about the isolation, um, the need for information that you must have. I mean, if you go to the doctor and they tell you your kid has something going on, I don't know about you all, but I'm the kind of parent I'm going to go and read everything I can about that. So you have these people who have this real information need. They also have this thing that's happened to them that, that they're trying to process and maybe they need other people to help them do that and maybe feeling kind of isolating with that. So when we talk about the socialization, it's not only um, having programming, but maybe thinking about the support groups, book groups, those kinds of things. Um, so this person is talking about parents in therapy that I knew that were dying for some sort of socialization uh, with other parents who they're dealing with the diagnosis. And as I said before, I've worked a lot with deaf and hard of hearing kiddos. So in that situation, you have a kid who literally speaks another language and the parents are trying to learn that language. So that's a good example of like a support group that can be great to have because what happens is the kid learns the language faster than the parent. The parent gets left behind. They need other people to practice with. Um, so it can be, that's just one example of of a, a good need for a support group. And again, sometimes maybe we think, well, I'm a librarian, I'm not gonna run support groups, but you don't have to do everything. You can just find somebody who wants to run a support group and have them do it at the library. So, you know, our job is to be these connectors, not necessarily to do everything. When we're looking at increasing outreach, um, the data showed we've served so many families in our community that have no transportation. They have no access to the library or what they're offering. So maybe having more bookmobiles. Um, and again, if you're, if you're going through some stuff, if you're having some financial hardship, if your kid has just gotten diagnosed with a disability, the last thing on your mind is getting your behind to the library. So we got to go out there and find these people uh, because they're not necessarily thinking you know, if you think about your hierarchy of needs, they're not necessarily thinking that we can help them out. Although we can, we have a lot of great resources, but they're, we're not necessarily at the top of their list because they have so much, rightly so, going on. Transportation is a big issue. I kind of talked about this earlier. When you have a, a child with special needs um, and it can be an even big, bigger barrier. So having the library be free, be open to the public, and be accessible is really important. This was a big one. No shushing policies, right? So if I have a kiddo who is atypical in some way, and maybe they're loud, maybe they clap their hands, maybe they scream, I need to know that I'm not going to get shushed at the library. I mean, that's not very welcoming, is it? So the quotes here, I would hear from parents, we tried to go to the library, but my kid was all over the place. And so I got so stressed out, I'm never going to do that again. And someone else said, the library in the rural areas were not okay with a loud child. It's too small of a building. In a couple of weeks, uh, in a library a couple of weeks ago, the little gal that I was working with got kind of loud and the head librarian did not like that. So, I mean, I know we always have to balance the needs of other patrons with you know, patrons with patrons, but at the same time, anything that we can do to make people just feel comfortable, even if it is just offering them a sensory room or a study room where they can be a little louder in that designated space, um, just not making them feel any kind of shame or any kind of embarrassment for having brought their kids to the library. I think that's so important. 
letting people know we're so glad they're here, even if they have a loud kiddo, it's okay. And then scaling up, uh, which of course is that training. So having consistent, some people suggested having consistent training across libraries, um, which I, it can be super difficult, we all know. Uh, the librarian was just, just kind of disappointed about not really knowing what to do. So this is someone talking about whenever they needed an intervention for a child, the librarian kind of flustered and didn't know what to do and didn't know how to serve the family. Now, I hope that librarian turned around and figured it out and was prepared next time. But sometimes we don't know what we don't know that first time that we encounter a situation. It's always good, though, if you can kind of follow up with the people and like, hey, I didn't know what to do last time, but I've kind of, I've learned, I'm going through some training, I've got on some listservs. I think people really appreciate that kind of effort. And this quote, I know right now, especially with autism and the increase of, uh, in autism diagnosis, diagnoses, I know a lot of people have questions and they want to know more about it. So a training in that area. So this person's kind of saying, it doesn't even have to be a training just for librarians, right? I mean, everybody has at this point, someone who's autistic in their life. And so maybe the whole community can go to some of these trainings as a real community building activity. So we're almost to the end here. And then I wanna hear from you all. So here's just a summary of kind of what I've said today. The effort is totally there. Like we're doing a great job, libraries are accessible, we're generally welcoming, we're offering sensory story times, but there are barriers. Uh, there are low, There is low attendance right now for children with disabilities. And sometimes parents um, of children with disabilities, they don't feel welcome, either because of preconceived notions they have about the library, or because they took their child to the library, they were loud and they had a bad experience. So there is more to be done. Um, and librarians generally seem to feel unprepared uh, to properly welcome children with disabilities and that children with disabilities are sometimes underrepresented in, in library messaging. And that's something we can all work to change. So what can we do? We can create more partnerships. We can let people know the library is a relaxed environment, right? That we're all about, you know, fun, especially in the children's department and that we're not uh, upset if, if children are behaving like children. Um, we have to be aware of transportation needs and that might mean all kinds of things for all different libraries. Um, it might even just be as simple as being aware of when the bus schedule comes by your library and kind of having your opening and closing times correspond somewhat with that. And um, being really aware of entry obstacles, you know, hours, accessibility, the like the bus route, those kinds of things. Um, what we can do more of is providing and encouraging socialization as part of programs. So build that socialization into the programming. I don't know if anyone here has ever done a baby story time, but let me tell you those babies, they don't do much. The whole point of the baby story time is to get mama out of the house or dad out of the house. And they want to, so you want to build into those programs sometimes to talk about, okay, well, what's your baby doing? What's going on? And who's having trouble sleeping at night? And get people interacting with each other. Um, people want to walk away from programming feeling like they've learned something and they've had a social experience and that they did something good for their kid by bringing them there. And that staff training, again, it's not that I have to have all the answers. I just need to think, as a librarian, use my librarian skills. Who knows about this? Why don't I invite them over and either have them run a program about this or have them give us a staff training and then also just be focused on outreach. And that doesn't always mean that, you know, we didn't, we're out in the bookmobile. It can just be as simple as um, getting the word out that people are welcome in the library and targeting where those people are. So now I want to open it up to you all. What, what are your libraries doing or, or what have you felt inspired to do? Or what do you want to do? Maybe you have great ideas that you haven't had a chance to implement yet. Um, sorry, were you talking to anyone? I, I was talking to you, Lauren. Okay, sorry, I, just, <laughs> I, I missed something. 
Um, there's a couple different things. So um, right now I'm a PCA for a three-year-old with autism. And then um, I was working as a classroom teacher um, for the YWCA here in Minneapolis down the street from our local library at the time. And I tried to do some outreach with the library when I was a classroom teacher, but as a lead teacher, I just had too many responsibilities and really needed someone to like help bridge that effort to get these kids down the street. Um, and there's like a lot of behavior problems. It's a very specific socioeconomic group. But um, so as someone who's putting my foot in the door um, at Ramsey County Libraries right now, I'm a sub and like associate reference librarian. I'm trying to work with uh, my supervisors to see how in the future, if I wanna um, do some youth services programming, how I can kind of be the other end of that bridge for like, you know, early learning centers. Um, and also I uh, and appreciated how the growing diagnoses of autism was brought in towards the end of your uh, webinar, just because we try to go to the library, me and my little guy every Wednesday for family story time, but he's the only kid there with that diagnosis. And it just always feels like when we go to these things, he's always the outlier and there's no real programming for specifically kids that are always on the fringes and never really the center of the conversation or the center of the intention of the programming. So that's all I wanted to say. Have you had any conversations with the librarian about um, if they plan to offer sensory story times in the future or? Um, I didn't really get a chance to talk to the head library and I did talk to one of them. They do more than the other uh, libraries do that I've been into where they actually have like a, um, like a bin of sensory materials, but um, because I think Henry's the only one that goes there, um, they haven't really had the opportunity to think about the programming for that, but it is something I would definitely like to ask if they could communicate that with maybe some of their larger branches to have it maybe done there. If yeah. yeah, thank you for sharing, Lauren. Anybody else? Um, I can talk about some stuff that we do at my library. Mm -hmm. um, hi, I'm Shelby. Um, I work in the youth services department. Um, we've been doing, we just started our sensory story time back up um, to try to incorporate that. Um, and Shelby, tell us a little bit about, if you don't sorry. mind, if I can put you on the spot, how is sensory story time different than a regular story time? So we have, um, for ours, I'm, we just started doing it again. I kind of reworked it from what it was before, but we have like a very clear activities of what we're going to do, a schedule laid out um, for our kiddos. Um, we do a lot of I try to do a lot of repeating themes in them so they can have more of that, um, the recognition um, if we do a lot of them throughout the class. So last time we did like, we focused on colors a lot. So we did um, who's wearing a red shirt, um, that kind of song. So we did colors in there, uh, a couple songs with colors and manipulatives. Um, we did scarves. So they had this texture and they're all different colors. So we were able to incorporate that. Um, I try to keep it to like a pretty short story just so we have some more time for other stuff. And then we have some sensory playtime at the end where we have just kind of stations around. We have sensory bins, um, some tactiles for hands and feet. Um, we had like different textures, balls that they could throw into hoops, um, some bean bags they were throwing around. We have like all the fidget toys and the, like the different oils that you turn and it kind of makes the different Things. So we're we're trying to get a feel of what they like and what they're uh, going to be using it for. So that's how it's going so far. Awesome. And where did you get the training for how to conduct sensory story times? So I did in my undergraduate, I did um, training with groups of kids with autism. We had like an autism sensory playtime thing through our school. And it was just me and a handful of other People. So I'm kind of working off of that and then just other trainings that I've been doing. Um, so it's awesome. Thank you. I think I derailed what you were going to say, though, by asking you too many questions. What were you? Oh, you're say? fine. Um, I was just going to say that's one of the things we do. We work with a transition group also from the high school in our area. So the 18 to 22 year olds, um, we have them come for some socialization, trying to figure out how to use the library. 
because um, they will be aging out at the age of 22. So we try to get them in feeling comfortable with the library. Um, so that's a new thing we started. We have the sensory wall. Um, and then I'm trying to do, we're gonna start a story and sign program that is not going to be all sign language, but it's gonna be um, incorporating. So it's not all encompassing to families that are deaf and hard of hearing, but it's um, obviously welcome. And just trying to get kids accustomed to, sometimes people do other languages. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. And where, where'd you find your signers, Shelby? So we don't, so I took courses through ALA to do, um, to learn some of that for story time, sign language, um, and just making it very clear that it's a hearing person doing um, sign language in the program. And then I've been looking into how we can get um, interpreters if needed. Nice, yeah, if you live near a, a college, yeah, um, that can be a good way. And a lot of people don't realize um, most communities have a deaf church or a church where predominantly uh, deaf folks attend and they'll have a service and sign. And that can be a good way to meet some deaf folks. Yeah, we have um, the closest deaf and hard of hearing school to us is like 30 or 40 minutes away. That's great. Horrible. But it's like it's some distance for those families, but also trying to get um in contact with them. Well, that's that. awesome. I think too, another really powerful thing that I've seen uh, with deaf programming is if you find someone who is fluently deaf, having that person run the program yep. and having the English speaking person interpret. It's just like those small shifts really yep. are empowering, right? All right. Thank you, Shelby. Anything else? I think that's all. Thank you. That's awesome. Thank you. Anyone else? I, I wanted to make one point, and it's actually in response to what Lauren said, but then Shelby picked up on it. And Lauren, I wanted to say to you, remember, a program that accommodates or is designed for um, children with autism that is more sensory based, it does not exclude children who do not have autism. I think we we can so often get into this mode of if we do this, quote, autism program, that we're then excluding children without autism. No, in the same way that Shelby was just talking about doing a sign language program that wasn't all in sign. Yeah. And I thought, but there is absolutely no reason why hearing children should not be participating in a program that includes sign, because it's important that, that they understand not everybody communicates the same way. And what better way to introduce children to learning some basic sign? There we are in story time. So that's it's so important that we don't um, isolate ourselves. Um, that we remember, and it's the same thing because we talk in, in SLIM about making course materials accessible. And the point is, making materials accessible does not benefit just students with particular accessibility needs. It tends to benefit all students. Um, and so that's something I would just encourage you, um, you know, remember, you're not asking for something special that because your child is the only child at the moment with that particular need, that you're asking them to do something only for your child. You're asking them to do something for all children that happens to include your child more as well. Absolutely, Dr. Smith. And I have a whole other webinar about this in the SLIM archives talking about when we design programming around specific people, one, we know that we have an audience built in, which sometimes we don't know and we're just throwing programming out there. We don't know who's going to come. And two, a lot of times people come for reasons other than what we thought of. So when we're having that um, ASL program, sign language program, we're having people who are nonverbal for other reasons. We're having parents who want their kids to be bilingual. All kinds of people are showing up. So we, you're absolutely right. We don't need to be afraid to make accommodations for people. In fact, you'll be surprised who it will bring out of the woodwork. Andrew, did you want to elaborate on your comment, Andrew Evans? Uh, sorry. I, uh, I'm not sure if you can hear me, but uh, yeah. I, uh, I just, my, my goal is to become a, a 
school librarian. And I'm just thinking if I have the resources, you know, like there's so many opportunities for to get young parents who may may not be able to go to the public library or other uh, if you can have the resources and the time to do that to to get parents involved in in your public school you know and to to really help them lay the the groundwork for literacy and for um for just being involved in in what the school's doing um and give help provide them information about developmentally where their where their children are public schools can be part of that solution too i think absolutely and, and you got me thinking about that i'm fortunate that i that i was aware of this today so that i you got me thinking that direction absolutely i'm a former public librarian and i always tell people if they don't know where to start with those partnerships just go find another librarian get that school librarian on board with you it'll build your confidence about how easy it is to build partnerships sean Hi, and uh, I just want to make, I guess, a couple comments. Uh, Dr. Smith, love what you're talking about with uh, regarding to accommodations and building out accessible content, because uh, I've got a background in accessibility and creating accessible content specifically for uh, visually impaired and blind students. And one of my jobs I previously had was at a Cleveland Chiropractic College, uh, Cleveland University now, and they had a blind student going through their DC program. And so I got to work with all the faculty on creating accessible content, and it was really cool to see how the other students appreciated it as well. And whether that was just, you know, the way that they had to start describing things, you know, it couldn't just be like, oh, you you know, look here on this image. It had to be like, you know, inside this cell near the cell wall, there's this cytoplasm. It's all way beyond me, the science of it. But it was really cool to kind of see uh, them develop as instructors. And also the students have a really positive response uh, to the information they were receiving it in the way they were receiving it. So. Uh, stoked that you talked about that. Uh, I get pretty pumped up about accessibility stuff. So I just want to make that comment. I did have a kind of question, I guess, on the library side, because I don't have library experience. But um, when you're going in and you're looking at and kind of trying to be proactive and you're you're trying to guess, I guess, you know, staying compliant with ADA uh, for sure and having the technology and the things that you need, um, kind of where do you make that cutoff where you're happy with what you have, but then on the backside you do a community analysis and then you're like, okay, well, we need all these other things. And like, I, I guess, how does that all get balanced out and how do you try to prepare for uh, the results of a community analysis if they're just, I guess, wildly different than what your expectations were? Andrew, are you raising your hand because you have an answer to this question? Um, th no, that's not that's not really the question I was going to answer. Uh, so if someone else has the magic answer to that one, um, I'll be happy to step back. Well, anyone else can pipe in, but my answer is probably going to say it's where legalities meet funding. I mean, and that's like the the most want want kind of answer. But uh, you know, I mean, I'm sure we would all do as much as we can. But depending on what it is. A lot of times it's about doing the basic minimum and then whatever we can get funding for beyond that. And, and that's kind of where we end up landing a lot of the time as well. Uh, I work at a community college and, you know, it kind of ends up being a lot of the, the conversation about reasonable accommodation, like like where does reasonable identify itself and what can we do uh, within that scope? And that's always a, a tricky question to answer. Awesome. Dr. Smith? Um, the the a point I was going to make way early on before Lauren triggered me into uh, my exhortation. When you were talking, Dr. Long, about time, time and location, and we get so hung up on, you know, the library's open from nine to five, Monday through Friday. Um, I spent my first, first years of my working life working in the arts. Guess what? Nobody's free to go to any art thing Monday through Friday, nine to five. It's all in the evenings. It's all nights and weekends. So I started my working life working nights and weekends. Yeah. Um, and I think we we have to go into this understanding that we are in many ways a service industry where 
we need to provide service on nights and weekends. So that's the first thing is if our staff, if we set a tone and we encourage our staff to think of their jobs as nine to five Monday through Friday, we're going to run into a lot of problems. We really have to say, folks, we're in flexible schedules. We need to provide service outside, quote, regular working hours. But the other thing is we are so hung up on our buildings. Mm -hmm. And we get so focused on how do I, you know, how do I encourage the daycare center, you know, a mile away to bring 24 kids into the library rather than, uh, you know, Dr. Long, let's put you in the outreach van with a book truck mm -hmm. and send you to the daycare center. And how much easier is that to put you in a book truck in a van than to try and get 24 kids, um, you know, a mile away into the library. And I just don't think we're quite attuned enough to all the possibilities of taking our services out of the building, mm -hmm. um, especially for services for, for little kids where we don't need, you know, 500 books with us. A book truck can do it for us. Um, and how could we do that and and have a greater reach for less, you know, le less exact, um, 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 I've just lost the word, sorry, I'm losing words all the time, um, less problems for us. We also then have 24 kids being excited in the daycare center. We're not trying to corral 24 kids in the library. Now, you do want kids to be in your library, but there are, there are ways that we want both. We want to serve people in our library, but we also want to take those services to where people are. And particularly when you're talking about transport difficulties and other things, I'm even just thinking about when the Child Development Center on campus is bringing all the kids into the William Allen White Library for story time, and it's a major event to get you know, they're not that far away. What is it? 400 yards, but it's a major event to get. And I thought, how much easier would it be to take one adult librarian to the kids rather than the other way around? And it's those different ways of thinking that I think are really important for us when we think about how are we serving and how can we do things a little differently. Awesome. Lacey, I'm going to let you have the last comment, but before I know some people are on their lunch break, I want to make sure and share with you all. So this IMLS grant, we've had to extend it. I'm sure you can imagine we've had a lot of challenges trying to get into the libraries during COVID. That was just completely impossible. So right now in 2023, for those of you who might be listening to this recording, I am still collecting data. And so if you know someone who would like to participate, they're in a library in Kansas or even Missouri, um, just email me and I would love to talk to you further. Emailing me is not a commitment to do it, but we can just start the conversation about it. The more data I can collect, the better instructional tools I can create so that we can have uh, better conversations about these kinds of things. So please don't hesitate to email me. Lacey. Um, I was just going to speak on how you mentioned the frustration where not all libraries offer the same um, kind of programming. Um, my husband works at uh, McConnell Air Force Base, and I'm part of a face group, uh, Facebook group that um, it's spouses. <laughs> um, and a lot of times when people are moving and being relocated to our area, that's one of the first questions they ask is, I have a child with special needs you know, where can I find some, you know, what's, what's a good place locally for um, services, what, what churches are available for them, you know, um, but they, that's a big problem is that there's not kind of a nationwide um, standard. And yeah. so, you know, these people are moving from, sometimes it's from out of the country, sometimes it's from in country, but that tends to be a big issue for them. And, it's frustrating because you go, well, some places have this, this, and this, but other places don't. And depending on where you move locally is what you get. You know, if that doesn't already exist, that sounds like a great job for a librarian is creating an accessibility database nationwide. 
Yeah, and especially, I mean, with all of the armed forces, that would be a lot of people that they could serve. Absolutely. All right. Thank you all so much for coming. I really appreciate it. Uh, the good turnout has been great and your great participation, I appreciate. Thank you so much, everyone.